This is the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter, 2021. Lesson four from the series Rest in Christ is titled The Cost of Rest. It's ready for teaching on July 24, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, July 17. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, this week as we have a look at the life of David and see what lessons we can learn or what lessons you have in your word for us about the life and teachings of David, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us. Wherever we're listening to this podcast, wherever we are studying your word, whether it be in Kenya or in the Caribbean or in Canada uh, or the United States or uh, somewhere in Europe or Middle East uh, or in South America, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be here to guide us and bless us. May we know every day of our lives that as we walk with you, you are so faithful and give us the confidence to walk in this life, knowing that in the eternal life to come that's provided by the death of Jesus, we can be with you again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Psalm 51 and verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Let's read that again. Psalm 51 verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Many people seem desperate to find a little peace and quiet. They are willing to pay for it too. In many big cities there are internet-free rooms which can be rented by the hour. The rules are strict. No noise, no visitors. People are willing to pay to be able to sit quietly and just think or nap. There are sleep pods that can be rented in airports and noise-reducing earphones are popular items. There are even canvas hoods or collapsible privacy shields that you can buy to pull over your head and torso for a quick workplace break. True rest also has a cost. While the spin doctors of the self-help media would like to make us believe that we can determine our own destiny and that rest is just a matter of choice and planning, yet, at least when we consider this honestly, we realise our inability to bring true rest to our hearts. In the 4th century, Augustine put it succinctly in his famous Confessions, Book 1, as he considered God's grace. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they can find rest in you. This week, we look briefly into the life of a man after God's own heart to find out how he discovered the true cost of God's rest. Sunday, July 18. Worn and Weary On a balmy spring evening, restless King David paced the roof of his palace. He should have been with his army on the other side of the Jordan. He should have been leading God's people to defeat the Ammonites and finally bring peace to the kingdom. Not being where he should have been opened the door to temptation for David. Read the story in 2 Samuel 11, 1-5. What happened and what great sin did David commit? 2 Samuel 11, beginning at verse 1, It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him. And he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived. 
So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. David saw a very beautiful woman taking a bath on her roof. His sinful impulses got the better of him that evening, and he slept with Bathsheba, the wife of a trusted army officer. Like all ancient kings, David had absolute power. As king, he didn't have to follow the rules that governed everyone else. And yet, the painful story of David's family following this story-changing moment reminds us of the fact that, even as king, he was not above God's law. Indeed, the law is there as a protection, a safeguard, when even the king stepped outside it, he faced terrible consequences. As soon as David transgressed the limits of God's law, he began to feel its effects on all aspects of his life. David thought that his passionate fling had gone unnoticed, yet Bathsheba was now pregnant and her husband far away. Read Second Samuel 11, verses 6 to 27. How did David try to cover up his sin? Second Samuel 11, beginning at verse 6. Then David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing, and how the people were doing, and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house, and a gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my lord Joab and his servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house and eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live, and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Wait here today also, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now when David called him, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And at evening he went out to lie in his bed with the servants of his lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning... It happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah, and he wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retreat from him, that he may be struck down and die. So it was, while Joab besieged the city, that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war, and charged the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling the matters of the war to the king, if it happens that the king's wrath rises, and he says to you, Why did you approach so near to the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck Abimelech, the son of Jerobasheth? Was it not a woman who cast a piece of a millstone on him from the wall, so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go near the wall? Then you shall say, Your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent by him. And the messenger said to David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out to us in the field. Then we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate. The archers shot from the wall of your servants, and some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it, so encourage him. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased 
the Lord. Even David's most intricate schemes to get Uriah home to his wife Bathsheba failed. Uriah was a man of stellar reputation who responded to David's subtle hints. As in Second Samuel 11.11, 11, The ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my lord Joab and his servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? Eventually, a desperate David reverted to remote control assassination to cover his sin. And so to finish the day. It is hard to believe that David, to whom God had given so much, could have stooped so low. No matter who we are, what warning should we all take from this story? Monday, July 19. Wake Up Call In the midst of one of the darkest times of David's life, there was good news. God sent his prophet. Nathan and David knew each other well. Earlier, Nathan had counselled David on his plans to build a temple, and that's recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now, though, the prophet came with a different task to perform for his king. Why do you think Nathan chooses to tell a story rather than naming and shaming David immediately? Read 2 Samuel 12, verses 1 to 14. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveller came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But... He took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die, and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And, if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbour, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the son. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin, you shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Nathan knew what to say, and he said it in a way that David could understand. He told a story that David, the former shepherd, could relate to. He knew David's highly developed sense of justice and integrity. Thus, in a sense, one could say that Nathan set a trap and that David walked right into it. When David unwittingly pronounced his own death sentence, Nathan told him, You are the man, in 2 Samuel 12, verse 7. There are different ways of saying, You are the man. 
One can shout it, one can accuse and stick a finger right into the other person's face, or one can express concern and care. Nathan's words must have been laced with grace. At that moment, David must have felt the pain that God would feel when one of his sons or daughters knowingly steps outside of his will. Something clicked in David's mind, something tore in his heart. Why does David respond with, I have sinned against the Lord, rather than, I have sinned against Bathsheba, or I am a murderer? In 2 Samuel 12 verse 13, So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin, you shall not die. And then Psalm 51 verse 4, Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. David recognised that sin, which makes our heart restless, is primarily an affront against God, the Creator and Redeemer. We hurt ourselves, we affect others. We bring disgrace to our families or churches. Yet ultimately, we hurt God and drive another nail into the rough beam pointing heavenward on Golgotha. And so to finish today, from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 722, we read, The prophet's rebuke touched the heart of David. Conscience was aroused. His guilt appeared in all its enormity. His soul was bowed in penitence before God. With trembling lips he said, I have sinned against the Lord. All wrong done to others reaches back from the injured one to God. David had committed a grievous sin toward both Uriah and Bathsheba, and he keenly felt this. But infinitely greater was his sin against God. Tuesday, July 20. Forgiven and Forgotten. After David had unwittingly pronounced judgment on himself in 2 Samuel 12, verse 5, so David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die, and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And that included verse 6. Nathan confronted him with the enormity of his sin. David's heart was broken, and he confessed his sin. Immediately, Nathan assured him that the Lord also has put away your sin, in verse 13, and that he was forgiven. There was no waiting period for God's forgiveness. David didn't have to prove that he was really sincere before forgiveness was extended. However, Nathan, who already had predicted the consequences of David's sin in 2 Samuel 12, verses 10 to 12, went on to state that the child to be born would die. And we read that in verses 10 to 12. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son, for you did it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel, before the son. What does it mean that God had taken away David's sin? Did he just wipe the slate clean? Does everyone just simply forget about it? Read Second Samuel twelve ten to twenty three as you contemplate these questions. Second Samuel twelve, beginning at verse ten. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbour, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son, for you did it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel, before the son. So, David said to Nathan, 
I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin, you shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Then Nathan departed to his house. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. David therefore pleaded with God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. So the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. Then on the seventh day it came to pass that the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, and he would not hear our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. When David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, and changed his clothes, and he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and when he requested, they set food before him, and he ate. Then his servant said to him, What is this that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me, that the child may live? But now he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. David also must have wondered about these questions as he saw his world crumbling. The baby dead, his family in disarray, the stories of Amnon and Absalom are two great examples of real-life family troubles, and his future uncertain. And yet, despite the consequences of his sin, which had affected innocent people such as Uriah and the newborn baby, David also began to understand that God's grace would cover this and that someday all the consequences of sin would be done away with. In the meantime, he could find rest for his troubled conscience in God's grace. What does David feel he really needs? What does he yearn for? Well, we're going to read Psalm 51, verses 1 to 6. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak, and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. With Psalm 51, David went public as he opened his heart and confessed his sins. David's cry for mercy appealed to God's unfailing love and his great compassion. He yearned for renewal. When we consider the cost of rest in Jesus, we need first to recognize that we need outside help. We are sinners and need a saviour. We recognize our sins and cry out to the only one who can wash us, cleanse us and renew us. When we do this, we can take courage. Here is an adulterer, a manipulator, a murderer and someone who violated at least five of the Ten Commandments who called for help and claimed the promise of God's forgiveness. And so to finish the day... If God forgave David for what he did, what hope is there then for you? Wednesday, July 21. Something new.
After David had confessed his sin without trying to excuse it or gloss over it, he went on to petition God. What did he ask God for? Read Psalm 51, verses 7 to 12. Beginning at verse 7 of Psalm 51, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. David's reference to cleansing with hyssop utilized terminology known to every Israelite who had ever visited the sanctuary. As he referred to the ritual acts of cleansing described in the Law of Moses in Leviticus 14.4, he recognized the power of a sacrifice, the sacrifice, who would come in the future to take away the sins of the world. Leviticus 14, verse 4, Then the priest shall command to take for him who is to be cleansed two living and two clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. David also went on to ask for joy and gladness. In the face of the enormity of his sin, wasn't that a little audacious? Perhaps it may be helpful to listen to this paraphrase. Tell me I am forgiven, so that I may enter the sanctuary again, where I can hear the joy and gladness of those worshipping you. When Adam and Eve sinned, they hid from God's presence, we read in Genesis 3.8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Why do you think David's request, even after his sin, is so different? As we'll read that again in Psalm 51, verses 11 and 12. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. David did not want to lose the consciousness of living in God's presence. He realized that without the Holy Spirit, he was powerless. He knew that as easily as he slipped into sin with Bathsheba, he could slip into sin again. His self-confidence was shattered. David understood that future victories would not come from him. They would come only from God as he depended totally on God. The victorious Christian life is not all about us. It is all about Jesus. We yearn for his presence. We crave for his spirit. We want his joy of salvation. We recognize our need for renewal and restoration. We need his rest, a divine act of recreation. Creation rest is not far from forgiveness, as in Psalm 51 verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And this uses creation terminology. In the Old Testament, only God can create. Barra, B-A-R-A. And once we have been recreated, we can rest. So to finish the day, if you haven't experienced the joy and gladness of liberation from a guilty conscience, what is holding you back? If it is guilt, what could you learn from this story that should help you? Thursday, July 22, Reflectors of God's Light Probably the most natural thing for us to do after working through an embarrassing failure and experiencing forgiveness is to try to forget that the event ever happened. Memories of failure can be painful. What does David want to do with his painful experience? Read Psalm 51 verses 13 
to 19. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. When a bowl or a precious vase falls and breaks into pieces, we normally sigh and throw the useless broken pieces away. In Japan, there is a traditional art called kintsugi, which specialises in recreating broken pottery. A precious metal such as liquid gold or silver is used to glue the broken pieces together and to turn the broken item into something of beauty and value. Every time God forgives our transgressions and recreates us again, something changes. God's precious forgiveness glues our brokenness together, and the visible breaks can draw attention to His grace. We can become God's loudspeakers. Psalm 51 verse 14, My tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. We don't attempt to self-repair or auto-improve, even incrementally. Our broken spirits, our contrite hearts, are enough praise for God, and they are beams of light that the world can see surrounding us. Our experience of being forgiven attracts others who are searching for forgiveness. What relationship is there between Psalm 51 and 1 John 1? 1 John 1 9 reads, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 9 is a short summary of Psalm 51. As David knows that a broken and contrite heart, these, O God, you will not despise, in Psalm 51 verse 17, John assures us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can take God at his word. Again, David could not repair the tremendous damage that he had done through his acts and example to his family. He suffered the consequences of his decisions and actions, and yet David knew that he had been forgiven. He knew that he needed to trust by faith that one day the true Lamb of God would come and stand in his place. And so to finish the day, how can you learn right now to apply the promises of 1 John 1 9 to your own life? How should you feel after you do so and know that the promise is for you too? And 1 John 1 9 reads, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friday, July 23. From the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 725 and 726, we read, David's repentance was sincere and deep. There was no effort to palliate his crime. No desire to escape the judgments threatened inspired his prayer. He saw the defilement of his soul. He loathed his sin. It was not for pardon only that he prayed, but for purity of heart. In the promises of God to repentant sinners, he saw the evidence of his pardon and acceptance. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God. Thou wilt not despise, Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17. Though David had fallen, the Lord lifted him up. David humbled himself and confessed his sin, while Saul despised reproof and hardened his heart in impenitence. 
This passage in David's history is one of the most forcible illustrations given us of the struggles and temptations of humanity and of genuine repentance. Through all the ages, thousands of the children of God who have been betrayed into sin have remembered David's sincere repentance and confession. And they also have taken courage to repent and try again to walk in the way of God's commandments. Whoever will humble the soul with confession and repentance, as did David, will be sure that there is hope for him. The Lord will never cast away one truly repentant soul. End of quote. And that brings us to our five discussion questions for this week. One, how can we find the balance between recognizing our inherent sinfulness and need for forgiveness, and at the same time living like the forgiven sons and daughters of the King of the universe that we are? Two, why is all sin ultimately sin against God? What does it mean to sin against God? 3. What can we say to someone, not a believer, who struggles with the suffering of innocent people, such as Uriah or the newborn son of David and Bathsheba? How do we explain the love and justice of God in such a situation? How does the perspective of the great controversy offer a helpful outlook? 4. Why would God devote two full chapters of the Bible to the sordid story of David and Bathsheba? What purpose does the recounting of this story serve? And five, dwell on the idea that sin separates us from God as expressed in Psalm 51, 11 and 12. What has been your own experience with how this happens? Psalm 51 Verse 11, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. How would you explain to someone what this separation feels like and why it is so uncomfortable? Why is the promise of grace the only remedy? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Thanking God for Life and it's by Andrew McChesney. Fifteen year old Giselle didn't feel well when she woke up one morning. She prayed before getting out of bed as she always did. Dear God, thank you for everything you have done for me, especially that I am still alive, she prayed. She thanks God for life every day. She and her family immigrated as refugees to the United States from Rwanda when she was 12. She faced a difficult life in her African homeland, where her parents struggled to find work and the family had little to eat. She often went hungry. After praying, Giselle slid out of bed in the bedroom on the second floor of the family's small home in the United States state of Georgia and carefully walked down the stairs. She felt so weak. I don't feel well, she told her mother. Mother was talking on the cell phone, but she interrupted her conversation. Go back upstairs and go back to bed, she said. Maybe you'll feel better. Giselle turned around to climb up the stairs and collapsed. She heard mother call out her name as she fell down the last three stairs and crumpled onto the hard floor below. Giselle, mother cried, are you okay? Giselle was unable to reply. She couldn't breathe, so she couldn't speak. Mother hung up the phone and ran over. Giselle, Giselle, she said. Giselle still couldn't answer. Mother touched her forehead to see if she had a fever. No fever. Mother called Giselle's 19-year-old sister to bring an electric fan to provide some air. The cool air felt good on Giselle's face. She began to breathe. Are you okay? Mother asked. I'm fine now, she said. Mother wanted to take Giselle to the hospital, but the girl insisted that she was fine. Mother gave her some water to drink. Giselle later learned from the physician that she had collapsed because she wasn't eating properly. The night after her fall, Giselle prayed before going to sleep. She prays every night before bedtime, 
Dear God, she said, thank you for this day and thank you for everything that you have done for us, especially for keeping me alive. This quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help refugee children like Giselle obtain scholarships to study at Seventh-day Adventist schools in the North American Division. Giselle received financial assistance from a 2011 13th Sabbath offering to study at an Adventist school in the United States state of Georgia. Through the influence of the school, she gave her heart to Jesus in baptism. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.